So um, I would like to thank all of you for joining me. This is Kathy Lee with BK Forex, and today um, I'm sharing with you one of my favorite presentations, which is trading strategies for volatile markets and inside look into hedge fund trading strategies. Before I begin, however, I'm obliged to read to you this disclaimer, so um, if you bear with me, I'll get right to it. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Trading Forex carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. The high degree of leverage can work against you as well as for you. Before deciding to trade any such leverage products, you should carefully consider your investment objectives, level experience, and risk appetite. The possibility exists that you can sustain the loss of some or all of your initial investment, and therefore you should not invest money that you cannot afford to lose. You should be aware of all the risks associated with trading on margin and seek advice from an independent financial advisor if you have any doubts. The information, including commentary and trade ideas provided at VKForex.com, should not be relied upon as a substitute for extensive independent research, which should be performed before making your investment decisions. BK Forex LLC and VKForex.com are merely providing this information for your general information. The information and opinions presented um, do not take into account any particular individual's um, investment objectives, financial situation, or needs. Um, all investors should obtain advice based on their unique situation before making any investment decision and should tailor the trade size and leverage of their trading to their personal risk appetite. BK Forex LLC will not be responsible for any losses incurred, um, by, made by, incurred on investments made by readers and clients as a result of any information contained on BK Forex LLC. BK Forex LLC do not render investment, legal accounting, tax, or other um, expert um, or other, or other advice expertise is required. The services of a competent professional should be sought. Okay, so with that, um, let's go ahead and begin. So, you know, the markets have um, seen quite a bit of volatility lately on um, both an intraday and a day-to-day -day basis. So, in order to think about, um, you know, the appropriate strategies or the strategies that, um, that um, are interesting or, or applicable in this type of market environment, I thought that it would be interesting to look at how hedge funds and bank traders trade and if they're really as smart as we all think they are. So what do bank traders really do? Well, this is just a snapshot um, of a bank. And um, in this image, what you'll see is that there's two rows and a third row that is hidden behind them. And um, you know, usually this is um, a traditional banking desk. And what you have is the one um, towards the bottom of the slide is probably the um, salespeople. And the one in between are probably the market makers. So. When it comes to FX trading, um, bank traders usually implement, um, you know, what I or hedge fund traders usually implement one of these four types of trading strategies. Of course, there are many, many different types of trading strategies out there, and not all of them, um, not all of them may be applicable. But you know, there are some that could be um, applicable depending upon whether it's a bank trader or a hedge fund trader. So, how do bank traders and hedge fund traders trade? Well, the first way they trade is what I call short-term flow and momentum. Because if you imagine that, let's say, you know, you're a bank dealer um, working for, you know, Goldman Sachs, for example, and so the client calls into the um, sales desk, which is basically the first row of defense, which is the one, the row of defense at the bottom of the chart. So they call into the sales desk and they say, um, "I want to buy a hundred million euros." So they ask. Um, the dealer, which is the middle row here, for a quote, and the dealer gives them a quote, and then the salesperson will say, given. So that means that um, the client wanted to buy a hundred million euros. Um, the dealer has sold the, to the client a hundred million euros at X price. So it's a short-term flow. So there's one of two things happening at that time. Um, one thing is that the dealer has to get out of this position. He is now short. 100 million euros. So he's got to um, probably go into inventory some of that position. He's probably going to, you know, ride the market momentum away for a shift in momentum to basically get out of the position. So the first way they trade is simply defensively and getting out of the position. The second thing that happens at the same time, I would say almost simultaneously, is that um, at the time you have other going back to this image. You know, let's say these um, three guys in the back. You know, one is probably a euro trader, one is probably a yen trader, one is probably a pound trader. So, euro trader gets um, given, 
or basically sells a hundred million euros, so he's now short a hundred million euros. So, you know, pound and yen trader sitting next to him. One is enjoying his lunch, as you can see. But um, they hear that client wants to um, buy a hundred million euros. So that means that hundred million euros um, has to go into the market. So what they may do is start to um, buy euros on their own for their own profit accounts. Now you may say, isn't that front running? Well, yes, of course it's front running. But unfortunately, on the interbank level, front running um, can happen. It's not like the equity market where um, insider trading, front running can be um, illegal. Um, in the interbank FX space, um, there is no um, clear regulation. So as a result, front running um, happens, and it happens very often. So that is why the first way bank traders trade is they trade the short-term um, momentum or short-term flow. So if they're sitting next to a euro dollar dealer and they hear a hundred million euros needs to go through the markets to the upside, they may start to buy to ride that momentum. Now that pertains to bank traders. Um, hedge fund traders are slightly different because obviously they are not privy to this flow information, just like we as retail traders are not privy to this flow information. So what they will do is they will trade short-term momentum. And that's where you get a lot of the algos. That's where you get a lot of the um, algorithmic trading where they're going for the next pip or two pips or even in some cases 0.1 pips. That's where you have ro the robots. Now, in terms of short-term flow and momentum, I would venture to say that as us as retail traders, it's very difficult uh, and almost impossible to trade the same way um, the bank traders and hedge fund traders trade. But in the session today, I will um, discuss with you a way that you could ride short-term flow and momentum that kind of plays off the same thesis but in a slightly different way. Another way that these bank traders and hedge funds trade are event-driven trades. And that basically means news trading. And when it comes to news trading, you know, I've done plenty of presentations um, uh, for FX Street as well as at um, any live trade shows that you've seen, talking about news trading and trading proactively and reactively. It's what bank traders do. It is what hedge fund traders do. It is what we as retail traders can do as well. And, you know, I don't spend too much of uh, this session time talking about it because I've spent a full 45 minutes. I can probably spend, you know, two hours talking about news trading, if not more. Um, but when it comes to news trading, like today's um, University of Michigan, sorry, today's Consumer Confidence Report, and how uh, the consumer confidence numbers came out weaker than expected, and... Um, that was tradable, both proactively um, and reactively, more likely proactively than reactively, because um, we didn't have too much of a reaction reactively. But proactively, we, um, if you took a look at the what I've always called the, the um, leading indicators of economic reports, you'll find that the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Index dropped to its lowest level in a year. And this was released about 10 days ago. So if you went back and you took a look at that and you said, wow, the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Index plunged and to plunge to its lowest level in one year, maybe the conference board survey could decline as well. And, you know, you could take an educated guess um, and maybe short dulling in ahead of that. And if you did, you would have been right. Um, so there's ways to trade the data proactively and really reactively. Another great example is the New Zealand trade balance numbers that came out last night. Um, the numbers came out very strong. It proved to be very positive for the Kiwi dollar, and the Kiwi dollar um, did hit um, its daily highs today, um, or its one-week highs. And leading indicator for that was the uh, manufacturing PMI index. Um, it's not a stretch to imagine that if you have good manufacturing activity that you would have stronger trade activity, and that's exactly what happened. So anyway, um, this is what bank traders and hedge fund traders do, is that they handicap economic data and they react to it. Um, and as I said, I'm sure I've had Street has archived some of these webinars. If not, maybe in the next month or two I'll hold it again. It is one of my favorite ways to trade, which is event-driven trading. But we can have a whole you know, hour discussion about this specifically. The third way that um, bank traders and hedge funds trade um, in this volatile market is what we call market neutral mean reversions trades. And I'll show it to you a trading strategy that kind of capitalizes on that specifically. And then finally, this is more 
I would say this is applicable for both bank traders and hedge fund traders, which is that they trade what we call global macro, swing for the fences trade. The big, you know, Japanese are going to do, you know, um, QE, or the next ones to move into QE infinity, and therefore dollar yen should go to 100 trades. That's the type of trades that um, these traders do, and we'll go into that more specifically. So starting with short-term momentum, why does it work? It works because um, this is an efficient market in the sense that usually um, if news happens, it gets, or if developments happens, it gets priced into the market very quickly. And it works because um, they are so short-term in nature that bursts in price action could have continuation. So in terms of short-term flow, I believe that there are three types of short-term flow. Institutional client flow, trading for the next pip, and or there's three ways that you can interpret short-term flow because there's actually lots of different types of short-term flow. So there's institutional client flow strategies that these traders implement. There's trading for the next pip strategy, and there's new highs, new lows. Quite honestly, we don't have the luxury of um, sitting on a trading desk at a bank and seeing institutional client flow. So as a result, you know, we as retail traders pretty much cannot do number one. We also, you know, unless you're super smart and you have built um, trading models that can um, trade for the next pip, um, I don't think that it's an, a strategy that us as retail traders can do either. So number one is out of the question. Number two is out of the question. So what can we do in terms of riding short-term flow and momentum? Well, one of the ways to do that is to trade new highs, new lows. And a very popular trading strategy amongst um, the interbank space is the 1% new highs, new lows. And it's not rocket science because it doesn't have to be um, in terms of trading strategies. But sometimes, you know, some of the um, most popular trading strategies out there are the ones that are relatively simple. And so what um, bank traders may do is to look for new highs and new lows. But the first question to ask is what constitutes a significant higher low because oftentimes you will see a, um, a small high um, in a currency pair made and yet there's not much continuation. So in the hedge fund bank space, one um, metric that is very popular is 1% new highs, new lows. And it's quite simple. I mean, basically, it does require a little bit of an art because um, we are basically um, trying to figure out um, qualitatively what constitutes a significant high or a significant low. But if you're looking at this chart here, what I want, um, would like you to notice is um, what you will see. Let me see if I can annotate here. What you will see here is that um, in this space here, we had a huge horizontal line. And this is a four-month low in the euro dollar. So four-month low is obviously a significant low, in my opinion. So we're not just looking for a small break. We're looking for a 1% break. So when we have a 1% break, which actually is a huge significant break um, and does constitute, uh, you know, in my opinion, um, a significant enough a break to, um, to change the trends in the, of a currency pair in the near term, that's when you can look for continuation. And that's what we basically have, which is that which is that in this case, um, you do have continuation. Um, sorry for all these lines that are being drawn, but I'm, let's see if we can clear all my annotations here. Um, so this is where you do have um, continuation. If we have, have a break of a new, of a four month low by 1%, which is pretty much what we get here, then the movement went from about this low here is 126, 1% break. I would say, roughly speaking, is one is a hard pips. It's very, very rough here, so it's not um, exactly hard pips. But once it breaks the hard pips, then you can see in this case, it had about a 300 pip continuation. So here's another example on the right-hand side of the chart. Um, we have a multi-month high here broken. Breaks it on a significant break basis by 1% um, again. And when we have the break by 1%, you can see that in this case, we also have, I would say, about a 300 pip continuation. Let's go to the next chart. Here's the next chart. This is a break of a six-month high. 
More, my horizontal chart here shows the six month, um, the horizontal line here shows the six month high. When we finally get a 1% break of this six month high in the dollar yen, you can see that there's quite a bit of continuation um, afterwards. And then last example here, very long consolidation in dollar CAD. When we finally get um, that 1% break, which is right here, you can see that we also have a multi 100 pip um, continuation um, in dollar CAD. So it seems relatively um, basic, but um, it's something that um, I can attest to you um, is a strategy I've heard often on the interbank space um, that these traders do trade new highs, new lows. Of course, um, they are not necessarily, you know, exposing themselves to the, the entire move, but they do take, you know, parts of this move and trail their stops along the way. Some other ways to um, trade short-term momentum um, are basically the round number trades. Now, in terms of round number trades, um, round number trades are play off the thesis that, you know, round numbers are important. And at the end of the day, we are humans. And it, it is humans that are trading um, this market. And because um, it is humans that are trading this market, um, round numbers have a significance. So what I'm trying to say specifically is, um, you know, there's a reason why 105 is the level that we're watching in the Aussie dollar, because it's a big round number. I mean, 10400 is also a round number, um, but it's certainly not as significant as 10500. It's for the same reasons why, you know, we, um, if you're married, is why we celebrate our five year anniversary, 10 year anniversary, 15 year anniversary, and not 11 year, 12 year, 13 year anniversary. You probably do celebrate it, and I'm sure if your wife would, uh, would be very angry if you forgot it, but, um, you know, the 15-year the, uh, anniversary or the 5-year anniversary is much more significant than your 3-year anniversary, um, for example. So um, that is why round numbers are so significant. So going back to short-term flow and trading, um, there's two ways to trade the net round number. One way is to trade the reversal at the round number. Another way is to trade the breakthrough um, of the net round number. So let's take a look at the reversal first. Um, and what I want to show you here, this is a short-term five-minute chart um, of the, the short-term five-minute chart of the euro dollar. And what I want to call to your attention is that typically the first attempt to a uh, first attempt at a round number, first test of a round number, usually fails. Um, we see that a little bit with the Aussie dollar today where we had the 105 level, it went to 104.99 in essence, and has pulled back um, off of that. And um, this is characteristic of, um, of how currencies trade on a regular basis, which is that the first test of a round number often leads to a um, reversal. But it's not a huge reversal. Um, I would say anywhere between um, 10, more like 15, I would say, 10 to 15, depending upon what currency pair that you're trading to, about 30 pips of a retracement before it tries it again. So the first um, test of a round number could be your opportunity to trade um, a reversal. And in this case, you see the euro dollar, first test of 129, drops, 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 test 129, go long at 29 for a quick pop of 30 pip higher. And then you can see the second test um, here is when, um, let me show you, I'm going to annotate. This is the first test, and um, this is the failed test and the retrace. And it is only the second test of the 129 level where you finally get the break below the 129 level. Let's take a look at our next chart here. Next chart, um, you can see that basically um, 130 is this um, level here that we're watching. So the first test of 130 is the failed test and we get about a 10 to 15 pip um, reversal off of the round number. So a test, the rallies, 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 touches 130, fails to break it the first time, and then retraces. When it retraces, that's an opportunity to trade a short-term um, reversal. 
And then the second time it's a test, it finally breaks. I mean, the second test break is not the huge break. Um, it only goes to about 10 pips. But then eventually when it does break it, the root does test it the third time and finally breaks, that's when we have the bigger move in the euro dollar. So the all I'm pointing out to you is the significance of the round number and how it can be traded for both a reversal um, of the first test as well as the break. So this is um, the final example also looking at 130 and you can see here um, when we have the first test of 130 we have a little bit of a retracement. Um, the first test 130 it bounces back pretty much 9 or 10 pips. Um, it's Sunday night, you get more volatile trading, more choppy trading, but um, in this case, it's the third time that it tests because it tested it the first time, the second time, and the third time is when we finally get more of a break in, dollar, in um, the euro dollar. So that's an example of how, so that's basically how, um, you know, you could take some of the spirit of the short-term flow and momentum techniques that um, hedge funds and bank traders use and apply it to your own trading. Now, we know that we can't um, trade off institutional client flow because as retail traders, we have the luxury of, um, of, of knowing when, you know, 50, 100 million euros are bought. We also, you know, unless you're super smart um, and very good at programming and have access to really good price flows that you can execute on, we can't um, trade for the next pip because, like some of the algorithmic traders. But we, what we can do is the 1% new highs, new lows, or um, we can take advantage of some of the, or we can take advantage of, you know, some of the. Um, round number trades that, um, that we've basically, you know, shared with you today. So the second way is event-driven trading. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit, which is that news has continuation, and news is tradable. Um, now, of course, trading news can be very risky because you're subject to spike risk. Um, but as you can see here, let's say we had, you know, an off on payments report. This is older release, but I think still indicative of many, um, of many event risks in general. You get the news. You can either, you know, take an educated guess on how the news will be released, like the universe, like the consumer confidence number today, or the New Zealand trade balance number, or you could ride the continuation that follows after the news is released, like basically here. Here's another example, and as I said, you know, I can have a whole hour and much longer discussion on how to trade news, but we'll look at other strategies today and we'll leave news discussion for another day. And this is just another example of um, event risk trading where we have an interest rate decision by a central bank and once again, you know, you have the initial move and we, it, the Aussie dollar had a stall, but um, t that's characteristic of the Aussie dollar, which is you have the knee-jerk reaction, a tad bit of continuation um, immediately afterwards, which is what you see here. And the tad bit is not that tad, it's like a 30 pip continuation, which I think is still a relatively good amount. But then when Europe opens, that tends to be when you have the much more significant continuation. And then um, let's move on to the market neutral mean reversion strategies. And this is basically, um, this is a type of strategy that some of these um, hedge funds and banks tra traders um, implement on both a short term and long term basis. And it's um, basically um, the idea of when you have something that, um, let's say, has you know an average, and it basically trades very much outside of the average, what um, you're looking to do is to, um, is to uh, basically uh, trade a reversion to the mean. So it sounds really complicated, and um, the best way to explain this for you to understand is let's say, let's say you imagine that over 10 years, the euro dollar and the S&P have a very close correlation. Let's say there's a... Um, you know, 70% positive correlation, meaning that 70% of the time, um, if you overlay a euro dollar and S&P chart, they're moving in the same direction. Um, and we have seen the, that in the past, which is that when we have a risk on day, the S&P will rally, the euro dollar will rally. If we have a risk off day, 
the S&P will sell off and the euro dollar will sell off. But then you have a month, which, you know, we've seen recently too, where the sector diverged significantly, meaning that the S&P climbs to new highs and yet the euro dollar falls and falls and falls and falls. And then you start to have a divergence, meaning that the S&P and the euro dollar are moving in completely opposite directions. As a bank trader or a hedge fund trader who is trading a mean reversion strategy, what you would be basically looking to do is look for this correlation to resume. So what you may opt to do is to um, maybe buy the euro dollar and sell the S&P, looking for the spread between these two instruments to narrow. So um, that's what a lot of um, sophisticated traders do, which is they trade the reversion to the norm. So one way to do that is um, through our extreme fade strategy. Looks pretty complicated, um, but um, it'll be uh, much easier to understand once I um, show you what is going on in this crazy chart here. Um, so basically, this chart here has um, Bollinger Bands, and it's a 15-minute chart. It's a short-term strategy that trades the reversion to the norm. So we've got third standard deviation Bollinger Bands here, um, second standard deviation Bollinger Bands. Uh, let me get my annotation screen here. So this is um, the third standard deviation. This is the second standard deviation. And down here is the ADX. I want you to ignore all the lines except for the pink lines. Um, because the pink line is the ADX. In the next chart you'll see I, I actually um, clean it up and just leave it there. But um, what you're looking for, and since these are standard deviations, let me just explain to you what a standard deviation means. Um, it means that um, if we have a third standard deviation, it means that... Um, you know, it's extremely, extremely rare because it's three standard deviations away from the average. One standard deviation is already kind of rare. Two standard deviations is rarer. And then three standard deviations is even, you know, more extreme. So the whole idea is that we think about a rubber band effect, a rubber band. If you stretch something, you stretch a rubber band far enough, it's going to want to snap back. And that's what we want um, to play off of. And that's what the strategy tries to um tries to play off of, which is that when price action gets so extreme, you hope for a reversion to the norm. So this is where you see um, the euro dollar, sorry, in this case the pound dollar, um, rally, 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 and it hits the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. But just because it hits the third standard deviation Bollinger Band and it closes at or above the third, third standard deviation Bollinger Band does not mean that you take the trade. Quite the contrary. What you're looking instead is you're waiting for the currency pair to decline and show you that it is exhausting. And this is very important because oftentimes these extreme moves in the currency pair will be caused by a news event or a big announcement. So um, if you get a news event or you get a big announcement, what um, will oftentimes happen is that the movement of the currency pair will become um, very extreme. And you want for it to retrace first before um, getting in. You want it to show you that the momentum is waning before getting in. So that's um, basically what we are looking for, which is that you wait for the currency pair to sell off. Um, you wait for the currency pair to sell off and then close below the second standard deviation Bollinger Band. And when it closes below the second standard deviation Bollinger Band, <coughs> that's when you want to take the trade. So in this case here, what you're looking for, um, and also I apologize, I forgot to mention, on the bottom what you want is you want the ADX to be um, below 25. ADX basically measures strength of trend. And so since we are um, looking for um, the trend to weaken, ideally what we would like to see is for, the, um, is for the strength of trend to be less than 25. Now, this is a nice to have, not a need to have. Um, it just creates, you know, in my opinion, a higher probability trade. So just something to keep in mind if you see that on your charts um, as well. So basically, you know, that's what we're looking for. So you're looking for um, the currency pair to to retrace, um, and you can see here that 
it uh, closes below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. That's when you sell. And, um, you know, what you would do is your stop, um, it's also subject, subject to slippage by a broker, would be um, at the swing high, which since it's a 15-minute chart, usually tends to be um, not too um, massive. But, um, and your target is one times, your first target is one times risk. And your second target is um, basically, your second target is basically, um, you know, just a trailing stop per se. So here's the next example. Currency pair, whoops, rally, rally, rallies, closed at, or, uh, and this is all 15-minute candles, closed at the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. We wait for it to retrace. That's when it closes below the second standard deviation Bollinger Band. That's when we sell, stop at the swing high. First target um, is the amount risk, um, and then you can trail your stop using the remainder of the position. This is another example here. Currency pair closes at or above the third standard deviation Bollinger Band, but you don't take the trade. You wait. One candle, two candle, three candle, four candle, fifth candle is when it finally um, closes below the second standard deviation Bollinger Band. That's when you sell, and you can see that there's a, um, there's a accompanying sell-off that happens shortly um, thereafter. Let me see if I have another example here. And I always like to show winners and losers just as a reality check. And you can see here that, um, you know, in this example, we um, see that the currency pair closes above third standard deviation Bollinger Band. It closes below it. We try to sell. Then we get stopped out. One word of caution here is that this is dollar CAD deep into the Asian trading session. So um, when we trade a reversal, we want momentum to be on our side. But, um, you know, you probably don't want to be trading during this quiet period anyway because the um, – because the market, you know, tends to be, you know, very abnormal during that time. Now, this is one market mean review, neutral mean reversion strategy. There are plenty of others out there, um, and it's just an example of how um, you would trade a mean reversion trade. So global macro trade, these are big idea trades that more hedge funds do um, than bank traders, because bank traders are actually more short-term traders. And it's the whole idea of maybe, you know, QE will, uh, QE infinity will lead to gold, um, you know, 2000. We haven't seen that happen, but um, seems to be something people get quite happy about. It is ideas such as the long-term carry trade. Um, when it comes to global macro trades, you know, you have um, some very – um, high-profile people who've traded global macro. Um, you know, for example, one good example is John Paulson. In 2000, he shorted subprime, made $3.7 billion. In 2010, he beat the best hedge funds out there by $5 billion. 2011, he um, bought Bank of America. The point I want to make is that in this example here, you see that when you do global macro trades, it's what I call the swing for the fences trade. In the swing for the fences trade, you... Um, you trade big, but you could also lose big, and you could have huge drawdowns, because in 2011, his fund dropped 40% in value. Some of the biggest trading losses ever, like Morgan Stanley's $9 billion loss in 2008, are tied to some of these global macro trades gone wrong. Also, you know, more recently, we had the London Whale, who lost um, $2 billion on, you know, just kind of bad debt trades. Other big stories are, you know, like Howie um, Hubbler, who bet big on the rising house, housing market and also lost big. Can't forget to when genius failed to long-term capital. These were people who won Nobel pr um, prizes for economics, and yet their, um, their, their, their trades went wrong. And so the lesson you want to take here is that when you trade big, you lose big. And if you have no stop, you have risk of total loss in your, your accounts. Now, stops, you know, sometimes even with stops, you could have risk of total loss, but at least you have it there, which kind of reduces the chance of total loss. So with that in mind, what can we do as individual traders, which, and how can we control our risk? What you can do is you um, can trade shorter term, trade high probability, um, trade themes, and trade shorter term um, event risk with the hopes of controlling your risk. So, uh, you know, I showed you some strategies to do that. Now let's get down to business. Having a trading plan means that um, you have um, a business plan. If you don't write it down, you don't do it. So what you want to do is with every single trade, um, and as individual traders, you have a lot of accountability to yourself. And so you want to um, 
trade rationally. So with every single trade, you want to ask yourself, um, what is the reason for the trade? You know, how much am I looking to make? What am I willing to lose? So you want to have an entry strategy and exit strategy, and you want to basically, um, you know, have a a threshold of when you're willing to lose. I got some questions coming here about the Bollinger Bands. We um, do not like to trade the Bollinger Bands at all during the Asian trading session. And I actually have a um, a 17-page guide on how to trade this strategy that um, you can download, and I'll send you. I'll give you the link at the very end of this presentation. But um, what I want to um, uh, spend the last couple of minutes talking about before I answer questions is how we come up with some of our trading strategies and um, how you can apply the same thesis to some of your trading strategies. So let's get down and dirty. And I want to welcome you into um, our trading simulator. So how do we come up with trading strategies and how do we come up um, with um, with some of these ideas that we have, like the round number trades, like the um, event risk trades, like the um, extreme fade strategy and the 1% new high, new lows. We do, that, um, we do that by watching. Speculation is um, observation, in our opinion. And, you know, we believe that humans are very visual beings. Which is why we respond. Which is why you know, as humans, we respond to chart patterns, and that's why technical analysis is so popular. Um, and we watch the markets constantly. I've got you know um, multiple trading screens here where you know I'm reading articles, I'm writing articles, I'm watching markets at the same time. And um, because looking for interesting um, trading patterns and um, looking for interesting you know things that are happening. Um, but you know, the question is, is history a good guide for the future? Does the past always mean the future, predict the future? And I can say to you, you know, scholars disagree. Um, the, best, um, the best explanation for this is from Mark Twain. Um, and he says that history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Meaning that um, just because we have a head and shoulders pattern does not mean that you know, every single head and shoulders pattern will lead to a break of the neckline and a huge continuation. It may, it may rhyme, it may happen, but it will probably do so in a different way, um, meaning that, you know, just because the last head and shoulders break has a 5% continuation doesn't mean that the next one will also have a 5% continuation. It uh, means that maybe it will break and lead to a big move, but the actual move itself and the magnitude of it may be different. A call also not lead to a big move. So how do we find rhymes in the market? We do it by trading. We believe there's no substitute um, for practice, and so we are in the markets and trading every single day. And that's why we have a lot of trading strategies that are in laboratory. And um, these trading strategies go in and out of our laboratory. And, um, you know, for those of you that are BK subscribers, we open up um, uh, you to our laboratory every Thursday during our webinars, and we um, talk about all the strategies that are in our laboratory. We learn through playing and experimenting um, with our trading strategies and tweaking them, you know, on a regular basis. But we only learn when we trade live and not demo. Live trading has two benefits, real market conditions and true psychological reaction, because we all know that will behave differently, even if there's a dollar at stake compared to zero, to, compared to 100,000 dummy dollars. And also gives you real market conditions, um, and it, it, it feels like something's at stake when you're doing that. The real value of a strategy is not whether it works or not, but whether you will use it. So the steps to um, successful strategy development which is that you want first you want to trade the strategy live. Um, you, you want to define the initial rules, and then you want to refine visually on charts. Then what we will do is we'll um, also test our thesis in further detail using Excel, and then we'll code or pay someone to code the strategy. Once we get the results back, um, does it not mean that we're going to um, to believe the results immediately? I would say 99% of the time when we get the results back from a coder, there's something wrong with them. So we always examine our machine results. We never trust them. We um, also understand, you know, we look at the results to understand, you know, our drawdowns and our failures um, to see if um, it's something that, you know, we can handle. Can we handle five or six losing trades? How often do these five or six losing trades happen? So we look at the results and then we refine again. 
we trade the strategy live again. And then we assess our strategy every couple of months. I would say it's even more often than every six months. We assess our strategy every, uh, I would say, month for that matter to make sure it's still working along with what we want to do. And that's how we come up with some of these strategies and trading ideas. Um, and with every single strategy we have, you know, we don't look for the... Um, you know, one hit wonders, and we don't look for the swing for the fences and the big winners. We we believe in strategies that you know build your account equity a little bit at a time, and um, we hope to look for strategies that don't have massive drawdowns because we believe Warren Buffett was right. In trading, you don't win by winning; you win by losing. And it is um, for this reason that, um, you know, I encourage you to look at what we do at bkforex.com. Um, we provide um, a tremendous amount of useful information, including trading strategies um, and trading signals. We um, have three types of trading signals that we send to all of our subscribers. Some of them are position trades, which are medium-term trades. We have um, day trades and news trades that we send out on a regular basis. Um, some, and we also send out our calls on economic data, um, including, like, for example, um, today's call on the, on the New Zealand trade balance possibly being stronger and the U.S. consumer confidence number possibly being weaker. Every trade we have um, comes with what we trade, when we trade, and stops and limits along with updates along the way. So you're never alone with our trading signals. And we have something called the BK Trading Club where we have webinars every day. And in those webinars, we um, you know, share with you our trading strategies. We talk about the markets. We look at technical levels. Um, we give you an opportunity to interact with us. And it's kind of our version of coaching. We also have exclusive trading strategies um, in video format along with some texts and PowerPoints. So um, we encourage you. I mean, so there's a lot of value there as well. It's something unique that we have. And then finally, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, I have a 17-page guide on that specific Eurodollar trading strategy, the extreme fade. If you want to learn more about it, simply go to bkforex.com forward slash euro, input your information, and the strategy will be um, emailed to you um, almost instantaneously. So now I want to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. I'm sure some of, one of, you, some of you must have some questions out there. Was the first strategy tradable with 15 minutes and 5 minutes to? No, it's 1% new highs, new lows, um, and it's really 1%. What are your thoughts on the euro dollar? We're right now at the 200-day SMA right now. Do you think that um, the euro dollar could potentially go lower? I do think that it could potentially um, go lower, um, and I think that, in the, but you know, there is some support um, not to. Um, far from current le levels, um, but that's more short-term support. The real support, I think, is in the 126 handle. And um, 128.80 was the real support level before in the euro dollar. That's been broken. Seems like it's become resistant, so I do think that the euro dollar could slide um, further. In terms of whether the euro dollar has a future in of itself, um, of course, um, I have absolutely, um, you know, complete faith that the euro would be here to stay. I can't believe that, you know, the euro would be would evaporate because there's so much um, there's so much put into the euro dollar itself that it um, I think its viability is with that question. How do you place stops to prevent outlets from finding them so easily? Well, um, a lot of brokers there's I mean the stops reside usually with the brokers. So it's not necessarily that the algos know where your stop is. Um, the brokers probably know where your stop is. So the algos just assume your stops are probably at some critical level, and usually it's probably at a key level that you may have, um, such as a round number. Um, we have no problems going to our website, so maybe you want to try a different browser. Um, it seems to be working pretty fine. So just um, go to bkforex.com forward slash euro to download the um, free euro dollar strategy. Um, in terms of dollar yen, um, I do believe that there could be short-term correction dollar yen. I actually published an article, um, an extensive article on this, and I linked to it um, at, um, at, uh, on my Twitter, Kathleen Lean FX. Um, I do believe it could be short-term pullback, but in the long term, um, you know, I'm still bullish dollar yen. Why is the yen so alive and active and missed only talk and no action? Um, it's pre-positioning. It's these global macro trades positioning or global macro traders positioning for, um, you know, 
in anticipation of a big action from the BOJ. Handicapping economic data. Um, it, it's basically, is, is my specialty, and it's basically, you know, try, I've spent a lot of time um, and, you know, effort basically looking for correlations between economic data, and that's what I use to help me um, handicap data. I think the dollar yen will be range bound with a downside bias before the BOJ really takes action, especially if they disappoint on April 4th and they don't do anything. We could see a much deeper correction in dollar yen um, before it really gains additional momentum. And um, our results for our, um, our trading signals are all on our website um, under Traded Results tab, so I encourage you all to take a look at that if you have any questions about it. I'm um, much more of a shorter term trader, and even my medium hour swing trades only last for 48 hours. So that's what we generally look at, but um, you know, you, it doesn't mean that you can't be a long term trader either. Thank you so much, Darren, for your endorsement. Um, it is the strategy that's in the 17 page guide, so um, you know, I encourage you to download it. Okay, so um, with that, um, I thank you all so much for participating, and I will see you next month. If you like my webinars, like I said, we do webinars every single day as part of our BK4 subscription. Um, so, um, you know, definitely take a look at that, and there's, they're much more um, varied in terms of topics, so you may find it interesting. Thank you.